Today we are hosting uh, Professor Marco Marengo from University of Brighton in the United Kingdom. Uh, so Professor Marengo did, did his uh, PhD in Milan. Uh, he was a long time a, um, a professor at the University of Bergamo in Italy and now is a professor at the University of Brighton. Uh, his work mainly focus on um, uh, drops and sprays on th uh, flow uh, with uh, thermal properties and icing and freezing, uh, which is what is going to uh, talk today. So, Thank you, Ezel. Thank you for this kind of invitation today. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, give a seminar. I just checked with Virgil in my directory. Is that after 20 years, I gave my first seminar here, plus minus, I think, in the same building, by Stefan Zaleski in 1999. It was June 1999, so it's 20 years ago. So it's a really comeback. I'm very pleased to. Um, so, yes, as you see from the title, uh, we are going to speak about uh, drop impact, the formation of ice and wettability effects. Um, the basic idea at the end uh, is to give uh, an explanation of this kind of uh, technique to mitigate the ice formation of the airplanes. We call this uh, ice mitigation. In fact, historically, we start with the uh, application and then we try to understand how it worked. <laughs> because at the beginning, okay, oh, it's not too bad, it's working, but why? So, as you know, icing is uh, really a tremendous hazard. Uh, so, for we have uh, uh, many possible applications for in uh, cold regions, for example, in wind, for wind turbines, power lines, bridges, cars, uh, and of course, it's a huge uh, issue also in aeronautics uh, because the formation of ice can be very uh, dangerous, uh, as you know, for for example, for this very. I mean, uh, unfamous, uh, famous accident uh, of the Air France uh, from Rio de Janeiro to Paris, uh, which was due to the fact that was the ice was blocking the pitot tube, so the system was not able to, to recognize the velocity anymore. So, when we are speaking about anti-icing surfaces, we are thinking to two kind of solutions. One is the ice phobicity. Mm? So. We are thinking to a system that is uh, that has a low ice adhesion. Okay, this is a way. So the ice is formed, but the vibration, the air, the boundary layer that is formed is able to you know, to wash out the surface. The other one is the decrease of the nucleation temperature. So if you are able to decrease the nucleation temperature, of course, you are impeding the ice formation with uh, for a given temperature. Okay, and the third one is the increase of freezing time. So if you are able to increase the freezing time, you may think that again, because of the boundary layer, vibration, and so on, the liquid can be displaced from the surfaces, right? And then so you don't have the ice formation. On the other side, there is another way that we may think <coughs> linked to the superhydrophobicity, or let's say the hydrophobicity. So in this case, we would like that the liquid water, hmm, the liquid water is going, let's say, to be to to uh, to move huh, on the surface, impeding again the ice formation. So this is the point. And then, of why is the uh, the liquid water is going away? Because, for example, if you are thinking to droplets, you may have a dropper bound, or you have the shear flow shedding the droplets on the surface, or you have the drop roll off. So. This is a very dynamical condition, right? So the drop is impacting, okay? And then because of the uh, boundary layer, because of vibration, because of the, uh, uh, the impact velocity, we have that the liquid is going away. And of course, the, 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 there is no ice formation anymore. Pay attention also that uh, we are thinking to this kind of solution, maintaining, keeping the surfaces above zero degrees above the, let's say, the ice uh, formation temperature. Mm? In this case, we are playing also with the temperature. So there are questions. Mm? How does the surface wettability influence the ice formation? The surface wettability is, of course, important, but is influencing the ice formation in which way? When drops impact onto cold surfaces, how does the surface wettability change the process? We saw before, you know, we have the, 
discussion before this man, this um, presentation about the fact that the rope is impacting and is on a, on a hydrophilic surface. Plus minus, you have the same phenomenon for some temperature. Of course, if the surface temperature is going down, down, then you have some change, right? But if you are keeping the, the uh, let's say, only the, to look at the, at the wettability effect, the question is really, is the surface wettability a pathway to mitigate the formation of ice? So let's start with the isothermal drop impact. So super hydrophobicity is um, very interesting. So we may have situations where really the droplets are not wetting really completely the surface, like this one. Or if they are impacting, you see that the, also the smaller droplets are going to roll on the surface like that. Um, when we have super hydrophobicity, super hydrophobicity is the combination between chemistry with a large intrinsic contact angle, for example, to use uh, teflonized surfaces, but also we need to use a good morphology, mm, the proper morphology. The combination between uh, chemistry and morphology is giving us the chance to have a super hydrophobic surface. Okay? So the idea at the end is that on a super hydrophobic surface, the droplet is in a kind of a fakir state. No? So we have the droplet is staying on the pillars, let's say, or, or let's say on the morphology. It can be even also a random, not really a regular pattern like this one. But in this case, the droplet is staying on the, on the surface. And uh, the point is that um, we need to have a very high contact angle, but also a very low contact angle hysteresis. When you're putting a droplet on a surface, you have, in fact, two contact angles. Hmm? One is the receding and the other one is the advancing. This means that, for example, if you inflate the droplets, you have a different angle with respect when you suck the, the droplets in the other, on the, in the other direction. Hmm? So the two contact angles are different, okay? So for, uh, to have a uh, superhydrophobic surface, you need to increase the contact angle, but also to decrease the contact angle uh, hysteresis. On a smooth surface, using uh, chemicals like teflonized uh, surfaces and so on, uh, you can reach maximum of 120 degrees. If you are playing with a uh, uh, surface roughness, you can go up to 160, 164, even higher contact angles. The point is that when, a, when you have this kind of condition, of course, you are in the super hydrophobic uh, 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 regime, let's say, but you may have also intermediate state, so with a partial penetration of the droplet, and the so-called Wenzel state, so the droplets are really wetting the substrate completely. So there is also a definition. The classical definition is that the contact angle should be higher than 150 degrees, but if you're looking at the receding contact angle, which is very important for, for example, for the, the wetting and for the rebound of the droplets, uh, in fact, the best definition is to say that the contact angle should be higher than 135 degrees, and the small contact angle means less than, uh, hysteresis means then uh, should be less than 10 degrees. So this is the common uh, the common way to, com uh, to define a super hydrophobic surface. So, we need high repellency and high mobility. So, when the drop is impacting on a super hydrophobic surface, like that, we have this kind of uh, typical phenomenon. The drop is impacting, is forming, is spreading on the surface. There is a given point where it's stopping. Mm? There is a pinning time can be short, can be, can be long, but then we have the complete rebound because, of course, there is no adhesion, so the capillary forces are acting, and you have the rebound on these kind of surfaces. So we did uh, uh, really a lot of experiments on that. So what is important in our case now is to think that uh, uh, if you're looking at the Weber number, the Weber number is the ratio between the, uh, the inertia and the surface tension, the, uh, the, the kinetic energy and the surface tension, the surface energy, um, with a given Onesorge number, which is, in fact, the, the, the uh, ratio between the viscosity and this number, rho, uh, the square root of rho d sigma. So if you are keeping this constant, mm, which is quite easy with water, because for a given diameter, you have the same Onesorge, and you're varying the Weber number changing the velocity, mm, you have, uh, for example, this range of velocity, which is uh, 
I mean, one can say that it's not possible to get, let's say, aeronautical condition, but in fact, what is important to, to uh, know is that uh, it's important the normal Weber number. So when you have a flight, uh, uh, when you have an airfoil, the droplets are impacting in all possible direction. Okay, so this means that if the droplet is impacting this way, considering the normal Weber number, the impact velocity in this direction is lower. Okay, so considering really the, uh, the real conditions hmm, and uh, saying that the droplets are very small, up to 200 for the super large droplet condition, so in fact, this range from 28 to 685 for the Weber number is not too bad because even if the velocity is very high, we are covering, a, let's say, pretty much the aeronautical condition of impact. So we use different surfaces with different co advancing contact angle and receding contact angle. What is happening? Of course, I need a little bit to accelerate. Also because I included, uh, this morning I included something about nucleation and so on, and because uh, we had the discussion yesterday evening with, uh, with uh, Christophe, and I think that could be interesting. So, about drop uh, spreading, what is happening? Here is the spread factor. The spread factor is the, uh, uh, is the diameter of the spreading lamella on the surface. Huh? It's uh, adimensionalized. Here's a uh, dimensionless with the diameter of the droplet, of the impacting droplets. And here's the time. So. When you have a classical hydrophobic surface, you have this kind of inertia regimes at, until the top. This means the maximum spreading, okay? And then you have the relaxation. So with a little bit of recoiling, if you see, because when you are standing the lamella, and then you have a recoiling. When, the, when you have an angle that is a contact angle that is bigger than 100, uh, let's say 10, about that, you have zero here. This means that you have a rebound. Okay, what is happening that if you in, uh, increase the receding contact angle up to in this case 161, the rebound is happening earlier, right? And not only that, you have also a difference in terms of maximum spreading. So for, uh, the, uh, for uh, a very low wettable surface, uh, you have a maximum spreading that is about 30% less for super hydrophobic surfaces with respect to the glass surfaces. Okay? It's also, so we have a fast recoiling and we have the rebound not only on super hydrophobic surfaces because the super hydrophobic surfaces are here, uh, very good very efficient, but we, are, we have already the rebound also for, let's say, higher con uh, low, lower contact angles. But in any case, the wettabilities are very important and are very important for the recoil phase because you see, in this part of the curve, there is no difference. In fact, in the inertia part, there is no effect of the, wet of the wettability. If you're looking at the spreading time, this is the spreading time up to the maximum spreading as a function of Weber number. As again, you can see that with the glass and with the uh, super hydrophobic Teflon, you have a big uh, difference huh, in terms of the time to reach the maximum spreading. Uh, pay attention that, for, for example, for a super hydrophobic surface, it's due to the fact that you need to increase the roughness of the surface. Huh? You, uh, for a given Weber number, you have the problem that uh, you have uh, a splash. You have a breakup, so you have a, a lot of small droplets. So it's, it's not possible anymore uh, to have really a nice lamella so, to measure. So what is happening is that uh, up to about 200, Weber equal 200, there is a big difference. Above 200, let's see that, there, uh, okay, don't look at this blue one, but the others, uh, there is no effect again on the uh, maximum spreading time due to the uh, fact that it's very inertia driven. Okay, so the, the spreading is happening, okay, with the, of course there uh, are differences, but in terms of times, it's plus minus the same, independently of the, uh, uh, of the um, surfaces. Okay, there is a clear influence of wettability at moderate Weber numbers, so Weber numbers less than 200. Okay, here you have the breakup. So, Looking at the condition for rebound, we said, okay, one idea to mitigate the ice is to have the rebound, okay? We are keeping the surface above zero degrees, the drop is impacting and it's going away, okay? Okay, 
not too bad. Um, we can try to do, to do something in this direction. For example, if you have a super hydrophobic surface, I'm sorry, that, but, but I cannot say something about the surfaces because it's confidential, because in the, this work was uh, partially funded by a, a military company. So, so this was the problem. But in any case, aeronautical company, but it's working in military. So, uh, but in any case, we, we develop different super hydrophobic surfaces. What is happening is that um, uh, for uh, these angles are very high, so you have the rebound. Uh, maybe you have a small formation of droplets here because uh, it's very rough. If you, but what is happening? If you have uh, this condition, look, this is even better. The droplet is impacting and it's not rebounding. Oh, so this means that uh, the super uh, uh, surfaces are very good to rebound for the rebound, but not all the surfaces, not all the super surfaces are able uh, to allow the rebound. Okay? Mm. On the contrary, if we have a smooth hydrophobic, so uh, is, uh, is, let's say the angle is 107, 117 degrees for the advancing contact angle, but pay attention, the mobility, uh, the contact angle hysteresis is still very low, okay, it's the only 10 degrees. So a hydrophobic surface with high mobility, then you have the rebound. So it can be even better. So what is happening in this condition? In this condition is happening that if the velocity is very high, since the super hydrophobic surface is very rough, in fact, you are passing from the Cassie-Baxter to kind of intermediate state. So this means that there is a, the concept of super hydrophobicity is a kind of static concept. But if you are including the dynamic of the impact, you should consider which is the surface that is dynamically super hydrophobic. This is another concept then, okay? And in fact, you can build this kind of uh, graph where you have the advancing contact angle, a receding contact angle. Of course, this doesn't exist because the resist, uh, receding contact angle is always lower than the advancing contact angle. But what is happening is that uh, the deposition here is the region here. Then you are going to over, uh, high, let's say, contact angles and you have a rebound. And you have also the super hydrophobic surface. But for a given Weber number, for high Weber number, you have an impalement. So in fact, uh, you are going to have on super hydrophobic surface a deposition, not a rebound anymore. Hmm? And this is, of course, a problem in aeronautics a little bit because uh, the velocity can be very high. So you may be a very, very nice, you know, uh, surface, and you are sure that you have a rebound because it's working with the, with the, let's say you see the mobility, everything is fine, but with very high velocity, you have an impalement. So it's not working anymore, okay? <coughs> this was published in Langmuir uh, some times ago. But another point is that we found also there is a threshold uh, which is quite, uh, uh, let's say, you can find uh, in many uh, experiments, uh, so it's quite general, that uh, a general criterion for rebound is that uh, the receding contact angle should be higher than 100 degrees. The drop rebound time is also interesting. Uh, and uh, and uh, there, is a, there is a theory, in, I think in 2005 or six from Beyonce and Kere and so on, that is saying that the rebound time is depending only on the, uh, on the droplet diameter, okay? And, um, and what is happening is that we, in fact, we found a very similar result here. Mm? This is the work of Beyonce. And these are our data average when you have a, a, a super hydrophobic condition. So it's slightly higher, mm? but what is important to say that it doesn't depend on the velocity. So if the adhesion of the droplets on the surface is very low, what is important is the capillary retraction at the end. So the diameter is important. Okay, so we have a picture of what is happening when the droplet is impacting on isothermal conditions. Now we are going to non-isothermal uh, droplet impact. The problem is that uh, it's uh, too long. Uh, it's a complete PhD thesis here, so it will be very long to explain all the points. So let me say something about the time scales, okay? So the point is, you have the droplets impacting. Imagine that you are able to rebound. Hmm? The droplets are uh, impacting, they're going away. The question is, is the rebound time short enough to avoid the drop freezing? 
So the drop is impacting. If the freezing is very fast, then of course it's staying there. Huh? There is an addition. Or this impacting is going away if the freezing time is not so uh, uh, is not so short. So mm, okay, let's see what is happening. From the point of view of the characteristic times, uh, uh, a very very rough estimation can be okay. We have a dynamics time. And dynamical timing means that this is the meter divided by velocity, and we know that the spreading can be one two times the, this time. The relaxation can be 10 or even 40 times this time, OK? And the solidification time, this is a little bit tricky, because really depending is depending on the conditions and so on. A very rough estimation is to use a, a Stefan number like that. It's again, it's very, mm, but what is important to see is that this time is going linearly with the diameter, right? And this time is going with the diameter square. Which alpha? No, uh, capital A. Okay. Ah, no, the area of the area of exchange oh. of the, between the droplets and yeah. This is the reason why we have at the end the square. So there is a dependency on that because this is uh, there is an L which is the diameter. If you think this is the d cubic, so at the end is going to be the d square. But what is important here is that okay. If you are calculating this way, hmm, looking at the different diameters, and you looking at the uh, because this kind of convection, convection time and the solidification time, of course one one can say no. Pay, pay attention that also the, com uh, the let's say you have a dynamic, huh? but introducing a kind of dynamic also in other papers, it's possible to see that this time hmm, can be very slow very very fast in comparison with the conduction time so what is happening is that if you're looking at these times they are really very different of course depends on the condition depends on the velocity and so on so one can try to compare the rebound time with the solidification time mm. there are of course better theories but only to have an idea is that Almost all the theories are going in this direction. This is the freezing time in red, and this is the rebound time. So if you are doing experiments in, uh, uh, with millimetric droplets, uh, 10 power to 3 here, OK, microns, so one millimeter is here. Mm, and the freezing time is longer than the rebound time, most likely you have the same effect when you have uh, smaller droplets. Mm. When you have, uh, imagine to have an experiment where you have, uh, in this condition, that the freezing time is very fast with comparing in comparison with the rebound time, then you don't know what is happening here, really. Or maybe the freezing time is really uh, uh, longer, but can be also lower. Mm. So, but if you are in this condition, what is possible to say is that if you are working with millimetric droplets and it's not freezing, most likely is not freezing in this condition. It's only for that. Okay, so this is something very rough, but is uh, saying something about the fact that if you are doing experiments even with one millimeter droplets or with 500 micron droplets and so on, we can infer something mm, at least a boundary condition with respect to the impact of droplets of 50 microns or five microns or 10 microns. The problem is that as soon as we have a frosted surface, everything is changing. So if you have a non frost surface, uh, even at minus 15, you have this kind of uh, situation when you have the spreading, the maximum spreading, and then you have the recoil, depends on the wettability. Okay? Even uh, if they, uh, and then we, you can recoil uh, before the solidification starts. Or uh, you have maybe a, a, a ice formation here, like in a quasi layer, mm? but then you have still this kind of, uh, of a condition. When you have the frost surface, you have a pinning. So you reach the maximum spreading, and the liquid is staying there. Okay? So if frost is already formed, there is a pinning at the contact line. When, it's not, when there is no frost at all, you may have a recoil, even if you have uh, some ice layer uh, below the, the droplet. 
but it's not finished because in aeronautical condition you have sub cool droplets super cool droplets sorry so we would like to explore also this direction so what is happening when we have a droplet uh, impact of sub in super cool condition okay so this is a chamber we can reach uh, minus 17 degrees. The humidity is practically zero because we are using uh, nitrogen inside. We have a humidity sensor, of course, because uh, the, the, you have a lot of droplets impact, maybe, and then you are increasing with the vapor, you are increasing the humidity. So you need to keep everything at the same condition. So, and we are, would like to have an isothermal process. So the temperature of the drop is equal to the temperature of the environment and is equal to the temperature of the surface. So when we are saying that the surface has minus 20, means that the droplets are also at minus 20. Okay? It's isothermal impact. So we are doing the experiments with water and water glycerol. I don't want now to enter in this detail. Let's do it with water. <coughs> because the problem is the point is the viscosity. Okay? If you want, then I can describe this problem this problem. Because um, when you decrease the temperature of minus 20, they, uh, you have a variation of the uh, viscosity, even a factor 3. So in order to understand if the viscosity was the, uh, really the most important parameter, eh, we have uh, the water glycerol, because in this case, you have the, sa uh, with the, the same viscosity with uh, only water at minus 17 degrees. So this was the point. So what is happening? It's happening that uh, the drop is impacting. There is a recoil rebound, for example, on, uh, on a hydrophobic and superhydrophobic surface. You may, you may have a drop impalement above a critical impact speed, like uh, we said before. Huh? So if we have a superhydrophobic surface, if the velocity is enough high, you have an impalement. But what is happening that is very similar with the su uh, super cool droplets to what we have with the let's say, with the droplets at the uh, environmental temperature. So, for example, this is 23 degrees, minus 2 degrees, and minus 15 degrees. The same. Absolutely the same. So, good. Because uh, even the super cool drops are not freezing before rebound, which is becoming very interesting now. Okay? Okay. So, the story is developing in the right direction. There are a lot of uh, question marks. Uh, hmm? The process is, no, is not really fully understood, but okay. So we can hope for a solution. So what we have learned, surface wettability influences the droplet impact. Okay, we knew that. The drops rebound for a ceiling contact angle higher than 100 degrees. The rebound time is independent on drop velocity. The freezing time can be shorter than the rebound time for millimetric droplets, and we saw that. Otherwise, if you have a f frozen condition, you have a problem. Huh? The, you don't have a rebound. Okay? So, if we don't observe freezing for big drops, it is unlikely that we observe for small droplets. Pay attention, f because it's a very rough hypothesis. So, of course, it could be interesting to check this. So, and even su super cool droplets doesn't freeze. Uh, upon impact. So, but there are problems. Frost, for high Weber number, the drop penetrates on the surface, so we have impalement. There is a strong effect of viscosity, and high Weber numbers increase the drop contact time for super, uh, super cool droplets. And so, and, don't, and we don't know which is the heat transfer coefficient uh, for, the, for these conditions. So it's a little bit difficult to, to, um, uh, to calculate. Okay, in 2006, together with Professor Amin Fazli, uh, we proposed uh, this technique, the so-called icing mitigation, um, in order to uh, avoid ice formation. The idea is just what we saw until now. So the idea was to reduce the energy consumption. As you know, in aeronautics, for example, in order to avoid ice, uh, a part of the fact that maybe before they're taking off, they're putting on uh, the glycol, the uh, ethylene glycol, and so on, you need to increase the temperature of the wings up to 60 degrees. So it's a really it's a big consumption. Okay, the idea is, it's possible to use superhydrophobic surface in a, in a way that even if you are not at 60, but you are at five degrees, uh, you avoid the, the ice formation. 
okay? But of course, keeping the, the wings at five degrees instead of 60 degrees in terms of energy, there is a big, big jump, right? So this was the main idea. So let's do an experiment. We did an experiment on the ice wind tunnel. Uh, using uh, uh, two different uh, liquid water content because we sprayed, uh, we sprayed the uh, water mm, against uh, an airfoil mm, with a temperature that was uh, at minus 17 uh, uh, inside the inside the uh, the room, and also the droplets were, let's say, about minus 15 in this case, with, uh, when you have a low uh, uh, liquid water content, uh, between minus 5 and 0 degrees for high liquid water content. What is happening is that wh when, you, when you don't have any, any kind of uh, ice mitigation or de-icing system, you have the formation of the ice on the surface, or even when you have a liquid water content very high, you have the so-called glaze, glaze ice with the formation of ores. So uh, this is a little bit catastrophic. So we did experiments here in the ice wind tunnel. And so when we have uh, an uh, uh, untreated and unheated uh, test article, what we obtain is the formation of frost and ice. Hmm? The speed here of the was 42 meters per second. And you see also below, you have this kind of uh, situation with a lot of rivulets and the formation of ice. Mm? So the uh, temperature in this case was minus 12 uh, degrees Celsius. If you increase the temperature at 40 degrees, you have a heater here. Mm? And of course, you don't have ice anymore. Okay, But what is happening is that since you are heating here, you have in this position again the zero degrees. So you have 40 degrees zero degrees, you have a very strong gradient. What is happening is that, uh, wow, at 40 degrees, of course, even an untreated sample is able to avoid ice up to this point where we have zero degrees. But we have formation of small droplets huh? uh, above and below the sample, okay? This is the super hydrophobic situation. So this is the same sample, same condition. Okay, see that is completely uh, here, of course, there is a kind of uh, uh, edge effect because uh, here you, you have, uh, let's say, is not heated anymore. The heating is only in this part, okay? So, of course, here is not anymore a, a given temperature. What is changing, so it's completely free of ice. Hmm? The difference is that we, uh, we had 30 degrees, not anymore 40, 45, and 50, okay? And in fact, even with the high liquid water content, it's completely free. So what is, and again with 30 degrees. So we were able, in fact, to have uh, the, this condition. So we have um, the power that was 68 watt, and the temperature was 30 degrees in one case, and uh, with, uh, with the lower with, um, uh, liquid water content was 20 degrees. So in fact, from the usual 45, 40 degrees, we have 20 or 30 degrees. Mm. And not only, there is no run back ice. So even after the surface, the droplets were going away. They were washed mm, far from the surface. So in fact, we obtain 80% uh, of power less for the smaller uh, liquid water content. And for the high liquid water content, we have the energy saving on 20%. Why, my, why is m uh, my bank account uh, uh, still there with a very low amount of money and it didn't become rich with this, uh, with this something like that? Because uh, this is a problem, uh, and the problem is the durability. So these surfaces are not able to pass the aeronautical certification. Uh, imagine that when you have this uh, uh, kind of test, they are even throwing chicken they have a chicken, they have a, a, a gun with a chicken, and they are using the chicken against the wing to check the paintings. Okay? Not only that, also these kind of surfaces are not able really to resist, uh, let's say, the time for the maintainers. Of course, I don't put this data here because, again, it's confidential, but I can say this because uh, I think that is important. A uh, few years ago, three years ago, there was a European project, 8 million euros. I think for this, in fact, to repeat this kind of uh, situation, and they didn't find a solution. And I, I, I wrote they could, they could have asked me because uh, it was clear from the very beginning. But it's okay. This is the point. So uh, the surfaces are still uh, the idea is superb. 
it's working. It's, but uh, the, uh, the problem of durability is really the bottleneck. And these are the papers explaining this kind of stuff. Can I say something about the ice nucleation? I prepared this morning, I woke up at 7 for this. So, <laughs> so I said. You still have 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. Then it's okay. Okay. <laughs> This was uh, because I cut something in the first part. Then, uh, if you want, I can come back. And I put this one after the discussion with, uh, with the Christoph yesterday. So, ice nucleation. Of course, the ice nucleation is influenced by many factors. The, uh, the var the thermodynamics variables, the water purity, uh, the presence of gas inside the water, uh, how the process is, the cooling test, and co so cooling rate, uh, and so on is a, as a stochastic natural, so it's not deterministic. Mm? So the point is that is entropical is uh, uh, unfavorable because uh, you, have, uh, you are passing from disorder, liquid, to order. So there is an energy barrier to pass. Okay? So how does it work? This is the classical uh, uh, explanation. So you have uh, a starting embryo radius somewhere. Okay, but there is a critical radius. Below this ra critical radius, mm, you have a metastable condition. So, in fact, the ice is formed and it's going away. Formed and it's going away. Okay, formed and disappeared. Above this value, you have the formation of ice. So, the the uh, nucleation site is stable. Okay. And uh, what is happening is that uh, if you are calculating the Gibbs energy, mm, so this value for, the, for this critical condition, you are landing with this equation. So 16 pi, this sigma IL is the surface tension ice liquid. Okay? Uh, power to 3, and then you have divided by 3, and then you have the latent heat square, and then you have this part, which is very, very important. Because this part is the, let's say, is the supercooling, huh? and which is really the driver. If you increase the supercooling here, you are decreasing the, uh, the Gibbs energy. So in fact, you, is, you have uh, more favorable ice on the, firm, uh, on the surface. So how big is the radius? It depends on the condition. But let's say that is about 1, 10 nanometers. And this is making a big, big issue when you, are want, you want to simulate this, okay? Because we are speaking about nanoscale uh, simulations. The ice nucleation rate is, uh, is, the, is the classical with the Boltzmann constant, but it has two factors here. One is the Gibbs, free energy. But then there is another one, hmm, like a diffusion, uh, uh, diffusion uh, activation energy, which is very interesting. So, if you have, for example, droplets hmm, that are, uh, let's say, freezing on a surface, the fact that you have very close droplets huh, is increasing, let's say, the, the effect. Okay? So, this is something that is very interesting. And, uh, and not only that, there is an exponential trend. So, this means that if you decrease the temperature of 100 degrees, which is nothing, this is, is going up to with a factor 10 power 2 or 10 power 3, depending on the conditions. So a small difference of temperature is changing completely the rate for the ice formation. OK? Well, how much is the, uh, you asked me about <laughs> before, how much is the uh, sigma IL? Well, a good esteem is about 13 millinewton uh, uh, per meter. Uh, there are different work. For example, this is molecular dynamic prediction, which is prediction. Uh, the, the prediction is even linked to the uh, orientation of the ice. Huh? But you can see that the differences are very small. So a value of uh, sigma IL of 13 millinewton per meter is a good esteem. This was a homogeneous. So you have the droplets, you have for ice formation. What is happening when you have heterogeneous nucleation? Okay. So extreme supercooling, for example. Well, the work uh, of uh, Lee and the co-authors in uh, 2014 said that, uh, OK, you can try to go uh, at very, very low temperature, very extreme conditions. And they found that 
This is uh, the hydrophobic, with the, where you find that, the, let's say, you have the number of nucleation, let's say, with respect to, the, to a kind of reference point. And you see that the hydrophobic, mm, the hydrophobic surfaces are uh, worse in terms of formation of ice. Mm? But pay attention, this is not contradicting what we said before, because in our case it was a dynamical process. We have the rebound. Here the drop is depositing on a surface that is very cold. And in this case, uh, it's saying that uh, the number for a given temperature, hmm, you have really in a worse condition when you're going down to cool down, because you are uh, freezing uh, before an hydrophilic surface. Okay, of course, the pro this, uh, this work was, uh, was done with a very slow cooling rate, about 0 0.1 Kelvin over a second. Why that? One idea could be that on a hydrophobic or superhydrophobic surface, the molecules has a higher mobility. So since the ice formation is uh, entropically unfavorable, hmm, what is happening that since the, the mobility is higher, they, um, they can have a quick rearrangement. So, and then, of course, they are freezing earlier on a superhydrophobic or hydrophobic surface. It's a little bit tricky. Also, because there is another stuff that I cannot speak on, is about the quasi-liquid layer. So, most of the time, your liquid is on an ice layer. So, uh, can be, at the beginning, can be very, very, very small. Uh, and then, of course, it's going up, even microns. But at the beginning, you have, uh, let's say, 10 nanometers, let's say. Uh, so at the beginning, the ice formation is almost invisible, okay, but it's there. So the so-called quasi-liquid layer concept, which is very important when you have extreme condition of uh, uh, icing. What is happening when you have heterogeneous freezing then is that um, usually the Gibbs energy for heterogeneous uh, freezing is less than for homogeneous freezing. And in order to calculate this, you should include the cosinus of theta IW, so ice wall. This is going in this little bit this direction. So the point is that um, we have two factors. One is the wettability, and the other one is the roughness, because then also the roughness is important. In fact, what is important is the roughness divided by the critical radius. If it's one, or if it's two, or if it's 300, it's completely different, okay? So this number can be estimated, okay? There is a work in, uh, in 2013 that is estimating this uh, value here, okay? <laughs> this is uh, my work now, seven in the morning. <laughs> so uh, I'm not so sure <laughs> if, I, if I did everything right or not. <laughs> I did two cases. One is hydrophobic and the other one is hydrophilic. So I tried to understand if it was possible to calculate uh, how it's possible to calculate the contact angle ice wall. Hmm? This was a little bit a question also yesterday with Christophe. Ice wall. How is possible to calculate this in these conditions? You have liquid, ice, and solid. Huh? You don't have air. You don't have gas. Okay? So for a hydrophobic cases, I put the classical uh, equation for the Young, the balance, let's say, uh, and um, uh, in horizontal condition, of course, uh, it's not a soft surface, so the normal, uh, the normal component uh, is uh, negligible. So what I did, I tried to also to uh, be in a condition like in a super hydrophobic surface. Is I don't maybe we, after we can uh, check if my calculation are right or not, and I landed with this equation here. So cosinus of theta ice wall is equal to sigma LV, so the classical surface tension of, uh, of uh, water, minus sigma IW divided by sigma LE, ice liquid. We know this one, 30. We know this one for water is 73, okay? And there is a problem because it's, it's not easy to calculate the sigma IW, so the surface tension ice wall. Okay, so since we have this difference here, and uh, this is not really 
I, I mean, I don't know how to calculate, huh? is that this is the contact angle in this condition for hydrophobic cases. At the moment, I don't know how to calculate this. Okay? I did the same for hydrophilic case. Again, the calculation, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to enter now to the details. But I landed with this equation, which is a little bit more interesting. Because this is negative, always. So this means that um, for a hydrophilic surface, huh, the ice wall contact angle should be bigger than 90 degrees, which was OK. So it's ice phobic in some sense. Um, of course, it's something to, to prove. Eh? And this can be launched like an idea for this group. Eh? But it's uh, something that can be very interesting. Because this means that when you're using uh, not hydrophobic, but hydrophilic surfaces, uh, uh, most likely you have uh, the contact angle ice wall, eh? which is ice phobic. I would like really to test if this kind of theory that is, can be very rough, but okay, why not, uh, is interesting or not. Okay. Finally, uh, pay attention that we uh, all this discussion is done with static contact angles. As you know, for the droplet impact, you have also dynamic contact angles. Let's forget about Hoffman theory, Kiesler, and so on. So, what is important to say that uh, there is, a, for example, the work in 1967 from Knight uh, is said. A minimum value for the receding contact angle of water on ice, of water on ice, is 12 degrees. But it depends on the receding rate. So there is a dynamic effect. So what we have done before with the Gibbs is that there is in thermodynamic equilibrium. But when you introduce the velocity, of course, you introduce another factor. What is when you have a receding rate which can be very, very fast for let's say, in some condition for the droplet impact, because uh, when you have the maximum spreading, you are not in an equilibrium condition. You stretch the lamella. So you have the recoil. The receding rate can be faster. So this means that this angle can be higher. Higher. But we don't know how much. But it's very, again, very interesting to investigate. So. We have learned a lot of stuff, and we have learned that, uh, wow, if we find the durable uh, surfaces, uh, we, mm, we, can be, we can become rich. Let's say, eh? Because this is something very interesting. So the dynamics, so the time scales of the drop impact uh, is really the major driver for the rebound and the self-cleaning, let's so call anti-icing effect. So I need to, uh, of course, to thank a lot of people, because uh, behind this, uh, this work, of course, there is the first meeting with Ali Dad in Bergamo in November 26, 2006. But then also the research group in Bergamo and the, the, the uh, work that uh, I contribute to do in, uh, at ETH in Zurich. Uh, Alenia Armacchi is the company that supported us at the very beginning of this project with the, together with the Marie Curie project and so on. And this is the list of uh, the uh, publication that we have in this field. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I have a first question. I tried to conciliate true results with Virgil results. In, in, the, in the case of Virgil drop impact on the surface, we always have a thin layer of ice that is formed so that we cannot see any rebound. But we are not in super hydrophobic or even very hydrophobic surface. Yeah. So my, my first feeling was coming from your, 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 your discussion on the Gibbs radius that maybe the, if, the, if the roughness of your hydrophobic surface is smaller than the, than the Gibbs radius, then you cannot really nucleate solids. Mm. So in your experiment, do you see a, a thin layer of ice that is formed, but still the, 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 the rebound? Or, or no. No. As so soon as you have this you kind of formation of, uh, of the ice, uh, frost, or during, like you have uh, in your experiments, there is no rebound. In our case, there is no rebound. So then, then th my question is, how do you understand that you, you have not this ice formation during the impact? Because the, the roughness is more about few microns. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a big rough. radius is more uh, yeah. few nanometers, yeah. so it should not. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, I, I, let's say, 
we didn't check uh, at that scale. So it's very difficult. Okay, we can check only, I'd say, uh, what we saw. And what we saw is that uh, you imagine that you have this kind of surface, and maybe you have a roughness that can be well, five micron in average, at least R A. Maybe R Z can be even bigger, even bigger than 10 micron, I guess. So it's really big. We, we don't know, because then, of course, the drop is doing like that. If there is ice here, we don't observe it. What we observe is that if the surface is hydrophobic or even super hydrophobic, we still have rebound, even in super cool condition. Maybe there is a formation of ice, but the formation of ice is not changing mm, the dynamic of the of the droplet impact. Because an another point which is close to what you say is that uh, then you have air in between, and air can be a very isolating gas for this old term thermal exchange. That Absolutely. That leads to the formation of ice. Uh, I agree with you. Should be something to think about that. And then, uh, and then, what is happening in terms of Cassie? Maybe the air is a, is a really uh, important factor because if you have a droplets like that, and then you have a air, and it's not possible for the droplets to go in, in, the heat exchange is completely different. Could, could be, uh, could and this is maybe the reason why maybe the ice formation is really limited in some peak. And, and this is not. Uh, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. And this is not uh, really. Maybe there are, there is some ice, but because of the inertia, the dynamic system is. Or the rest of the of the liquid could could uh, freeze and then uh, melt yeah, the ice because yeah. you know you, you just have a point of you know, during the yeah. dynamics. The quasi liquid layer, the, the theory about the quasi liquid layer, are saying that it's 10 nanometers on a very smooth surface. 10 nanometers at the beginning. 10 nanometers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Can be. Other question? Okay, so I have one question. Uh, as a strategy for ice mitig icing mitigation, have you considered uh, uh, the fact that uh, by um, well, uh, when ice freezes and then when it's uh, when it's cooling down, it contracts, and at some point it can be fractured or or it can delaminate from the, the surface. Uh, you mean the surface can be laminated? No. no for, for example, if you have a uh, an, an ice pancake on uh, a substrate that is uh, still cooling down after freezing, uh, it may uh, it may break down or uh, or, yep. delam or detach for the surface just because it is uh, uh, contracting. Yep. But every the time that in the for the ice mitigation, every time that you are forming frost or ice on the surface, of course the, the spray is continue to come. So the the the, uh, the droplets that are coming are not impacting on the surface anymore, but are impacting on the pancakes, and then of course it's, it's, uh, the ice uh, is forming. So it's not really it's not possible to stop the ice. What we saw is that, for example, what is interesting is that uh, a super hydrophobic or hydrophobic surface is also ice phobic. In terms of adhesion, non in, not in terms of, in terms of uh, formation of ice, but if the ice is formed on a super hydrophobic surface, the adhesion is less. And there is also a study about this, I, which is very interesting. I can show you something which is maybe going in your direction, but I need to. Okay, this one. The. This is the work in 2010 from Varanasi and co-authors, and you see that this is the ice adhesion now. So the ice is already formed on the surface. And this is one past cosinus state uh, receding. Let's say these are the angles. It's going in this direction. So of course, when 180 degrees, when, when, very, when you have a very um, uh, non-wettable surfaces, huh, the ice adhesion is very low. And in fact, we, we tested this with our hands. It was very, very easy to uh, break the ice, to detach the ice from the surface. So this means that another possible effect is that even if on a hydrophobic surface or super hydrophobic surface, you are forming some ice, see that there was no run back ice and no formation of ice islands. Because there is a, this adhesion is very low, the ice adhesion. So, there are, in fact, two effects. One is that it's very difficult to form the ice because you have. Mm, but not only that, if in some part 
mm, or the test article, you have something below zero degrees, so you are expecting that there is ice, the ice is not ad adhering on the surface. So the, uh, the adhesion force is, is uh, smaller. Thank you. Uh, other questions? No? Okay, so let's thank uh, Marco again. Thank you.